So we're excited about this episode. Uh, we're sitting down with Henry Ward, who is the co-founder and current CEO of Carta, formerly known as eShares. Probably almost everyone listening to the podcast has used that product or is currently using that product. And Henry is one of the most impressive operators in tech over the last 15 years. You're going to see and hear some phenomenal stories and lessons that like very, very few people can say or experience nearly as good. Yeah, couldn't agree more. When you think about the startups over the past couple cohorts, they're on, they're on Mount Rushmore. The reason is because of special founders, special operators, special early team members, and he's learned so many things along the way that he's going to share. We're excited about this one. Well, thanks again for joining us, Henry. We're, we're stoked to have you on the podcast. Uh, Sterling and I have been fans of yours and of Carta's for many years. I was telling Alexis from your team that I think I started reading your blog feels like 10 years ago now and followed you on Twitter 10 years ago now. I tweeted about eShares back in the day. And so it's pretty, pretty exciting to have you on. And thanks for joining. Uh, yeah, absolutely. We've got like four or five topics we want to cover, not a ton of time. But one of the first things we want to do, Henry, is kind of walk through the eShares Carta journey, starting as early as you're willing to go and maybe even a step before eShares at uh, you, you're, you were a first time founder at Second Sight, right? And then you end up starting Carta. We'd love to hear how did Carta get started and how, what did you learn from being a first time founder to a second time founder? Can you kind of tell us the founding story? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I, I started um, uh, Second Sight, which was, uh, it was like a robo advisor, like a betterment or a, a wealth front, but you know, it didn't do well. Uh, it, it died on the vine. Uh, Andy, you know, at Wealthfront and Josh at Betterment did a way better job than I did. Um, uh, so, so their companies took off and, and mine died, um, which in hindsight worked out pretty well because Carta ended up being a, a better fit for me as an entrepreneur. But after I, I went through the, closed the business down and went through the, the trough of depression, I, I, I came out of it and, and just couldn't imagine doing anything else. I was like, Oh, you know, what do I do now? And every, every, uh, thought, uh, that I had was, Hey, I want to do something again. Uh, and, you know, having been a failed founder, just, you know, being a moderately successful founder just sound like incredible, uh, to me. Uh, and so, um, so I just had to do it again. Uh, there was just something about being a founder, you know, killing your own food, um, uh, uh, everything you do matters. Um, uh, nothing, you know, nothing happens unless you make it happen. Uh, it just, it just really resonated for me. So uh, I was a founder without, without an idea. Uh, you know, a lot of the conventional wisdom, I, I'm very unconventional founder in the sense that the conventional wisdom is start, you know, fall in love with the problem, dedicate yourself, dedicate your life to solving this problem. And then starting a company as a vehicle for you to go solve this problem. I was the opposite. I didn't really care what the problem was. I just wanted to, to start a company uh, and be a founder. And, and one of the investors I worked with on my last company was like, Hey, you're a finance guy, sort of, you know, take a look at this cap table problem. Uh, is this, Manu, Henry? this is Manu. Yeah. Manu Kumar over at canine ventures. And, um, you know, he said, if you'll start this, this company, uh, I'll invest in it. And, uh, so we ended up working on this, this idea together and what got me excited about it was, was less the cap table piece. That was, uh, sort of the, the, the wedge into this, this idea the the thing that really got me excited about it was this idea of secondary markets. Um, you know, if you own the cap table and you, at the time, you know, the, the real idea actually wasn't cap tables. The original idea was electronic stock certificates. Um, oh, wow. uh, a lot of people don't actually, uh, you know, don't remember that, but it was called eShares. It wasn't called eCap tables because uh, it was called eShares at the time because we were digitizing electronic stock certificates, which were all sent on paper, you know, kind of like they used to do it in the railroads when you invested, you know, in the railroads in the 1800s. And we were going to, you know, send electronic stock certificates versus email that, or over email. That was our innovation. And through that, we could, we could build the cap table. And uh, but the idea was if you could digitize all these paper stock certificates, you could build a central exchange and build what we called at the time, the NASDAQ for, for private markets. And, uh, that's what got me excited. And we really thought at the time 
we'd spend two years building this cap table software. And then suddenly we'd open up the stock market and ta-da, you know, big company stock market. Um, it didn't work out that way. Instead, we're a big cap table company and no stock market. So it's funny kind of how things, how things work out. Um, uh, didn't, 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 didn't work out the way we planned. What were the things along the way that kind of showed like, cause you do, you have this vision of where it's going to go and two years in, you're going to, you're going to change everything. What did you learn along the way? What were the assumptions you had when you started that were eventually proven incorrect? You know, a lot of the stuff we saw and a lot of the stuff um, we didn't. So, you know, we saw um, uh, electronic stock certificates and we continue to, to we, you know, that, the, the, that digitization or what we call dematerialization of the private markets uh, is, a, is an ongoing trend. A decade in that, that is continuing to be something we do. Uh, so, you know, uh, whether it's dematerializing LP interests, you know, in our fund admin business, whether it's dematerializing private equity by putting LLC portfolio companies of private equity, you know, investments on the Carta or real estate or other asset classes. So that dematerialization trend, you know, we, we continue to, uh, to do. Um, uh, we didn't see 409A valuations uh, when we started the company, um, but we found that really quick. You know, we launched cap tables in January 2014. Um, by by April of January 2014, our first customers were like, hey, can you send our cap table to uh, our 409A provider? And we're like, w- wh- why do they need that? And like, oh, well, they need it because they do the valuation on the cap table. And they were paying us, you know, I don't know, 500 bucks a year. And they were paying the valuation firm 5,000. I was like, hey, we'll do that for you. And so we launched our 49A product uh, and and that took off. Um, and we didn't see that coming. Um, you know, today we're, you know, 2,000 employees, uh, you know, 370 million or so in, in ARR. 30% of our revenue is actually our fund administration business where we manage the back office of these venture funds. And that, that we didn't see at all, uh, that yeah. we found, we discovered in 2018, 19. So there's just a lot of, a lot of stuff we saw, uh, a lot of stuff we discovered along the way. So you mentioned something that's worth, I think a lesson for founders, which is when they, when, when the early, uh, customers you had were sending these cap tables to 409A valuations, were they asking you to solve it for them? Or did you make the connection that we could solve that for them and you decided to innovate there? I'm curious if you relied on the customer to pull it out of you or if you did that out of your own insight. We did it out of our own uh, insight. And it, it's it's a really good point, Tyler, because if I look back at um, uh, the things that we've, we've built, um, a lot of companies, I think, you know, we'll build for what the customer asked for. The customer says, we want this. Can you do this? Can you help us with this or, or that? And I, I think there's a lot to be done there. I'm not not discounting it. But um, if I look at uh, uh, historically all the products we've built that have taken off, that have really worked, um, it's it's usually not what customers are asking for from us. Uh, it's usually... Um, stuff they don't ask for, um, but we see that they need that we come in and fill the gap. And I, I, it's a really great question. Like, why is that true? And I, I think there's sort of this, this kind of unique thing for founders, which is um, the, the best companies, the best founders actually fill a need that customers don't realize they have. Um, because almost by definition, if customers know that they want something, probably somebody's already built it for them. They've asked for it, right? It, it's right. the best. The best founders build something that the customer doesn't realize they need yet, and that's like cap tables. Nobody had asked for cap table software before Carta. Nobody had asked for automated four nine A's before Carta. Nobody had asked for automated fund administration before Carta. And so it's on us to say, oh my gosh, there's something here that people need, but they don't realize they need it, and I can come in and innovate. And th- those have been our best products. Fascinating answer. I got to drill in a little more. What is it that enables you to pick up on that? Because the customers don't make it easy. They don't ask for it. When you look back at Carta's success in doing this, and I'm sure there's been failures too, is it that you're just especially attuned to the customer or what's a lesson that founders can take from that to make sure they do what you did? 
Well, and, and let me add a part two to that. Henry, was this you every time who was kind of connecting these dots or were these people on the team? Did that sort of flow down or how much of this is, is the, the unique ability of the founder to be opportunistic? I think it's, it's largely founder. I think this is kind of the, the art and magic of a founder is to see these gaps, to see these unmet needs or unmet demand uh, that, that people don't see. Um, uh, sort of almost by definition, um, people don't know that, that people don't know they need something that they've never needed before. Um, and a founder like creates something out of nothing. Uh, and if you look back, a lot of these products were, you know, uh, either my idea or, you know, the team came and they're like, Hey, we have some ideas and, you know, we iterate on it and we try. Also, don't get me wrong. I've had a ton of terrible ideas too. So, like, uh, you know, a lot of ideas I've tried, you know, have, haven't worked either. So, out of every idea that worked, you know, I probably had ten that that didn't. Um, uh, but the job of a founder is not to be right most of the time. The job of the founder is that when you're right, you're really right. Uh, that that's what matters most. Um, I would say that the the thing that has worked, at least for us, I think every founder is different. They they all find their kind of unique wedges that they, they're they really good at seeing insights in the market for. I think the thing that, that we've been good at uh, as a company and, and maybe me as a founder is that uh, whenever we see companies, businesses uh, spending money on human labor, especially high, high dollar labor, um, which involves spreadsheets, we're like, hey, there's an opportunity there. Uh, cap tables, spreadsheet problem with $500 an hour, $1,000 an hour lawyers, All right? Valuations, spreadsheet problem with $1,000 an hour valuation analysts, fund administration, spreadsheet problem with very expensive accountants, right? It's just expense accounting, spreadsheet problem. You know, it's just like, these like a very clear, you know, math problems that are complex huh. and require high labor. And we're like, hey, we can turn that into a software problem. And um, that's where we've 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 seemed to excel. Love that. So you you mentioned the scale that you're at, two thousand employees. Sounds like coming up on four hundred million in revenue. A lot of the founders listening are obviously going to be much much earlier than that, and probably all of them. Uh, let's let's go back to the early days. I'd love to know how you got your first couple dozen customers, and when you finally realized, hey, we've got something here. We've got product market fit. Can you walk through that process in a couple minutes? I, I think every founder like kind of has like a growth hack um, that they sort of figure out. And my growth hack um, was very simple. And now it's like a like everybody has used it, so you can't use it anymore. But but back then, um, uh, back then we were one of the first companies to sell software to other startups. We were the first one of the first startups to sell to other startups. Uh, I think it was us and Zenefits at the time. And you may remember Zenefits, Parker's company. Nobody else did that. Back then, if you were a startup that sold to other startups, like nobody would fund you because the market wasn't big enough, right? You had to sell to Fortune 500 at the time or you had to be consumer, right? To, to basically get funded. So back then, you know, if you went to an investor and you were like, hey, I got this great software that will help your startup save money. They were like, oh, that sounds awesome. You know, um, I'd love to get you know, tell my companies about it. And if I said to them, hey, I'll give you a discount code, uh, you know, to, um, to give to them, all the investors are like, that sounds amazing. I'd love to give that. Because then they, it makes them look good, right? They look like they're um, value add, right? They, they got this great deal, you know. Yeah. I, now it's like so overdone, right? All, all, all founders are getting bombarded by their investors trying to sell their portfolio companies, you know, software to them. But back then, nobody was doing that. We were the first ones. So I'd go do these investor meetings, you know, every time in my seed or series A round, when I was trying to get money, raise money, they'd all pass. But I'd say, hey, would you like a discount code for your founders? And they'd say, of course. You know, and I'd save them. I'd say, hey, you're, you know, I'd give you half off your 49A. And I would send them an email going, hey, you know, Mary or Bob, it was so great to hang out with you. Thanks for the meeting. Uh, here's a discount code for half off 49A valuations at eShares. Uh, and I just run my finger across the keyboard to be a six, three B two. And, you know, just have your, have your, you know, uh, you know, portfolio CEO, send me this code and I'll give them half off. And they would just forward it to their, um, 
uh, CEOs at my venture fund.com uh, Google group. And then all the CEOs would forward it to me going, Hey, my investor recommended you and I get a 50% discount. Can I sign up? And, and we just did that over and over and over again. And the flywheel just spun. Uh, and it was great. Uh, and that's how we got the, the flywheel spinning. Fascinating. It's funny how consistent there is that there's this early clever hack or hook that a founder figures out that actually adds value to all parties involved. So yeah, that's a common thing there. Sounds like it was true for you too. I think Divi had some of those, right, Sterling? Yeah, we had a few, not nearly, not nearly as clever as what Henry was up to, but we did all right. <laughs> so you, you talked about, you talked about meeting with the investors and one of, one of your favorite lines that Tyler and I love is that fundraising is a filtering exercise, not a popularity contest. So as you were having those meetings, Seed Series A, what did you mean by that? And, and, and how did those interactions go? Yeah, it was, um, you know, I, I feel for a lot of early stage founders because you hear about like in TechCrunch and, you know, you hear about founders, you know, like me probably on this podcast and everybody's like, oh, you know, um, uh, you know, Henry or whoever they're listening to or reading about must have been, they must have just, you know, had this great pitch, you know, just like, you know, molasses on the tongue, you know, just so charming and compelling and visionary. Uh, and, um, you know, my, my experience of early stages, it, the pitch matters, like I'm not saying it doesn't matter, but so much of level one fundraising is finding people that cared about your problem. Um, and I, I feel bad because I think a lot of founders are like, oh, I went into a meeting, I pitched, you know, they zoned out. You know, they didn't care. They passed and I suck. You know, I just, you know, I'm not a, I'm not compelling enough. I didn't have a good story. I didn't have whatever. And um, it's just not that. Like I could tell within 90 seconds if, if somebody was going to invest or not, because either they cared about private market stock and cap tables and a NASDAQ for private, for private markets, or they didn't. And if they didn't, it didn't matter how compelling I was. Like they just didn't care. They didn't resonate to this problem. If they did, then it did matter. Like your pitch, pitch does matter uh, if they care, but you have to get the filtering right first. You have to get the people that care about your problem. And then once they care about your problem, then you have to be compelling. But I think a lot of people get really down on themselves, you know, for, for the 95% of people that don't care about your problem. And, and what I coach, you know, when I angel invest, what I coach the founders on is like, just quickly weed the 95% of people that will never care about what you're doing. It's not you, right? It's just, they don't care. Find the 5% you do that do care. And those are the people that you hone in on. What the 95% are good for is that's where you do your pitch practice, right? That's where you just like, you just do your reps in just like the comedians, you know, even Chris, you know, even Chris Rock, Dave Chappelle, you know, they go and they do the basement stuff, right? When they have new material in, in the crowds, right? In the peanut galleries, right? Where nobody's watching, they test out the new material to try it before they do the Netflix specials. And that's, that's what the 95% is for. That's where you just test your material. I, I love that. And I think it's a big learning for most founders. The other thing is this is, this is a partnership, right? And so even if you were molasses on the tongue and you could convince anyone of anything, you actually don't want people, you want them to be like converted on their own and then be like, Oh, this is the company that I've been waiting for. This is the founder that I, that I, you know, we, we, we're sharing this vision because then that's a real partnership. This, this was a painful learning for me in hiring because I just because somebody was smart or articulate or had a good resume, I wanted them on the team. But really, you're looking for fit. And so if you show up authentically with the 5% of people who care about your problem and they care about the, the thing that you're trying to build, then you at least have a chance of finding an actual partnership. Yeah, I, it's such a good point, Sterling. You mentioned like my, my blog posts. Part, part of the reason I... I put those blog posts out and they were extremely opinionated, right? There were people that really liked them mm. and there were also people that really didn't. And, and the reason that I put them out um, was actually not, you know, I told the recruiting team cause they're like, Hey, a lot of people are reading them and they don't want to come in at eight 30 in the morning, you know? Oh, they don't want to come in and work for a sports team. You know, they don't want to come in at, like, 
you know, you know, come into the office every day, you know, and work hard, right? Like they don't want those things. And I was like, but, but that's the point, right? Is that <laughs> the, the thing is, is when people did come in, they wanted to come in. They, they were there. Like they weren't coming in to Carta to interview go, or eShares and go like, so what do you guys do here? You know, they were like, <laughs> they were very interested in what we do. They self-selected in. And, and that, was, that was by design. Because when you put that stuff out there, it is exciting to the right type of person. And it's, it's a repellent to the wrong type of person. So just imagine how much you saved yourself and the people applying, right? It's, it's mutually beneficial to just be upfront and honest. Like, this is who we are. This is what we're about. And if, and if that sounds like you, please join us. Um, but yeah, I, uh, I, I think it's amazing how often we get that wrong with our investors, with our employees, with co-founders, like all of these things where we try to be everything to everybody instead of just owning who we are and seeing who that, who that attracts. Totally. I was talking about this with the, the people team, uh, and we talk about culture. Um, and I have a little bit of a contrarian perspective on this, which is a, li a little hard for, I think people to understand, but, um, especially in kind of, I think, modern environments. But um, uh, if, if, um, if, the, if people uh, can't decide that they aren't part of the culture, if we don't stand for something that people say, you know, we're not a part of it, then we stand for nothing, right? Yeah. And so, like, people have to decide, like, we, if we stand for something, that means people have to say, we, you know, <laughs> we, don't, we don't agree with that. Right. Otherwise, we stand for nothing. Uh, and so what do we stand for? Uh, and that is like a very tough question. Um, and being clear about what we stand for uh, is, to me, the most important part of culture, which means people will disagree with it. Uh, and that's OK. Right. There's many, many other country, uh, companies to work for. For those who have listened to other episodes, we had Gary Tan on a couple of weeks ago and Gary talked about the need for every startup to be a cult which is kind of what we're talking about here. You've got to have some distinct parts of your culture that people opt into or out of. So common thread and all the best startups as they have some of those features. So Henry, you mentioned a couple of them. Meet every morning in person at 830. We're a sports team, you know, not a family. Uh, you have people read specific books. I think it was like how to win friends and influence people and maybe a couple others. Uh, my question is, have you grown out of all that or do you still retain parts of that? And maybe more generally, how do you scale as a leader and retain what makes you unique and cultish versus grow to 2000 people? Are those in conflict and how did you do it? It's hard. Uh, it's very hard because at, at scale, you know, asymptotically, um, uh, when you're small, people want to join a, uh, a cult. They want to join a group. They want to be part of a, uh, a group. Uh, everybody wants to belong. Uh, when they, you join a startup, not because you're looking for a job, you're, you're looking for um, identity. You're looking yeah. for a club. Um, at scale, you don't join a 2,000 person company because you're looking for identity. You're looking for a job. Uh, and asymptotically, people are just looking for a good job. Uh, and so what kind of happens is when you get bigger, you, you, you lose the cult, cult uh, mind frame. Uh, uh, and in fact, it's hard to kind of run like a cult mind frame. You just have more bureaucracy and legal and HR and, you know, kind of the risk curves change, right? You know, when, when you're 20 people, the risk is you go out of business, you know, when you're 2000 people, you know, the risk changes, right? There's, there's other types of compliance, legal, HR, you know, all sorts of other kind of risks that exist. And so things, things do change. What I think starts to happen, and I'm, you know, you guys are asking me as I'm learning, you know, I've never run every day. My, my job, uh, I I'm every day. I'm like less qualified for my job. Right. Cause you know, <laughs> today is the biggest company I've ever run. Tomorrow will be the biggest company I ever run again, you know, or even more. Right. <laughs> so, so I'm learning as I go. Um, but what I'm, I'm starting to realize as these companies get bigger is, um, you know, uh, uh, asymptotically, you know, uh, uh, the people that join are, are looking for a good job and that's okay. There's, there's room for that, right? You're, you're sort of normal kind of average, you know, person, uh, on the fringe, you know, is here for a job, but there's always a core group of people call it the 80, 20 rule, you know, 80% of the people at a large company are here to have a good job. And my job, my job as CEO is to give them good jobs. 
right? That's like what I do. And then there's like 20% that are here still, still here for the cult. Um, and my job is to nurture that 20% that are still driving the company. And there's 20% of, of people, and I hope there will always be 20% that are, you know, t torch bearers for the company that drive it. And 80% will be here for the job. And that will always be true. And maybe over, you know, we're, for 10,000 people, it'll be more like 90, 10. Um, but you always need that core group driving the company. Because if everybody's here for a job, uh, it, you know, it gets a lot harder. It's not nearly as much fun. You mentioned something that I think is fascinating and it's just it, it, the risk tolerance and the calculus changes the more like when you when you were e-shares and you had not a dollar of revenue, it's very different than coming up on 400 mil, you know, 400 million. And, and but I, I wonder, d can you do things to decrease the bureaucracy and the legal and compliance in the HR or is some of that just the laws of gravity? Here's another way of arguing it, Henry. If 20% is the one you're trying to nurture, wouldn't that be better if it was 40% or 50% or 60? And it's your job to kick the ass of the bureaucracy and fight it back and retain what made you special 10 years ago. So are we wrong there? Or what do you think about that? Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a great question. And I think every company has got to, got to find its way, you know, um, uh, one could argue I, I should, you know, kick kick more, you know, butt of, of bureaucracy. You know, I think there's also this version where we're also regulated. You know, we've got a broker dealer and we're an SEC transfer agent and, you know, um, uh, you know, we're in Europe and, you know, da, 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 da. So there's like there's all this sort of like regulatory stuff. Um, so so the question is, like, on the on the spectrum, can, can you run a 2000 person company like you run 20 people? Uh, you know, or do you run it like, you know, a bank, right? Uh, and, you know, if we're somewhere in the middle, right? Like, do you nudge this way? Do you nudge that way? Like, where do you land? So, so it's, it's, it's somewhat of a spectrum. What I think is, is actually, um, at least what I'm learning uh, is um, probably the best way to run a company like ours is I used to believe that there's sort of like one culture fits all, you know, and that's kind of like, I think, the way that, you know, Built to Last, you know, is sort of the seminal book of our kind of business generation, which which has been, this, you know, which which has a sort of, you know, mono monocultural perspective of business. Like there's one culture that defines the best culture of the business. And that's what all 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 businesses should be like. Um, but but when you look at like ours, like having multi cultures cultures might actually work a lot better. Right. You can imagine our regulated side of the business should be quite bureaucratic, like they shouldn't make a lot of changes. They they should have committees and process and document everything. But like maybe our innovation side, we should run, you know, like yeah. like a 20 person startup, you know, and, and be maniacs. Right. There's a great book on this called Loon Shots, which is really about how you how do you manage that? that dichotomy um, where you can have, they call it, I think, artists and soldiers or something like that. But like, how do you manage that dichotomy? Um, and then how do you how do you manage a culture where you, you keep this multiple this plur plurality of cultures without clashing um, within one umbrella? And I think that's one of the things we're, we're trying to, to sort through as an organization. Is it, this is, this is a really cool line of thinking, but is it hard for you because you were there when it was just the cult and, and have seen it grow? And is it hard for you to realize that that, that is maybe how it should run and that there's 80% of people who are looking for a good job, maybe not maybe not quite the, the ferocious missionaries that you had in the early days? Is that Was that an adaptation that you had to go through or did that just make sense as, as part of your evolution in becoming a big successful business? You know, it's, it's hard because you see like um, the early employees that, you know, uh, struggle to adapt to the new, you know, to new way, but love Carta and, you know, over time kind of leave sometimes a little bit, you know, disenfranchised and disillusioned. Um, often mo many of them have gone on to start their own companies and do their own thing, which is, you know, as a, as a CEO is wonderful to, to, to see. Um, but it's also really funny because they'll they'll come to me and I'll you know I'll get the early employees together for barbecues once in a while and at my house and you know they'll say Henry you've changed uh, <laughs> you know because now I I used to you know be in the office in shorts and no shoes and now like I'm I wear collared shirts to work 
you know, like, like, you know, I'm, I'm not, I don't wear a suit, but like now I wear belts and pants and they're like, <laughs> you ch money has changed you, Henry. Uh, and there, there is this like, this like, um, you know, kind of professionalization, uh, of, uh, of, of the company, um, that, you know, good or bad is like, you know, uh, uh, happening. Uh, and I think, you know, it's, it's hard to, to kind of, um, for a lot of people to see that, including for me, right? It's a different, it's a different company than it was seven years ago. Henry, a couple other questions around like specific tactical advice to founders. If I were to interview someone on your executive team or someone who's worked with you the longest and ask them like, what are the most famous Henry isms, the frameworks that he tries to drill into the company, the sayings that he has, are there one or two of those that come to mind that they would instantly say, oh, yeah, he he drills this principle into us or he says this saying very often? What are a couple of those things? I I took this I modified this a little bit um, from Andreessen Horowitz. So at Andreessen Horowitz, um, they do this thing where um, uh, Mark shared this with me, um, but they they say uh, um, there's no bad ideas when they look at investments. Um, it's about timing. And I, I won't do it justice. He he kind of gave me the pitch where he's like going through like the TV was actually invented like in 1860, um, but like the technology wasn't there. You know, the guy was ridiculed. It didn't work. But, but it took another like 60 years before they had the technology to make the cathode ray tube and it worked. Right. The Palm Pilot, you know, but it took another 30 years before the iPhone you know, came out, you know, that, and it just like, you know, web van, right. It took another 20 years before they had the mobile phone for Instacart. Right. So like, and he just goes through this litany of like, you know, every idea is a good one. It's just a question of timing. And, and I, and, and, and I love that framing. Right. And so at, at, at the Andreessen Horowitz, you know, partner meetings, when they look at investment, what makes it so powerful is when they, when they do an investment discussion, they don't discuss whether it's a good idea or a bad idea. What they discuss is whether whether now is the time for that idea, which is a very different way to think about it. And so I do that, I kind of change that from an operational perspective. So when I talk to the execs, what I tell them is um, when we have these debates, right? Everyone talks a lot about debates, you know, who, you know, are, you know, we need the debate, you know, get to get the right to, to get the right answer. Um, what I do is my version of that is, hey, everybody's right, right? Everybody is correct. There isn't like, uh, we're going to debate to get to the right answer. Uh, everybody is right. The question is, we're all right through our own aperture, right? Like I have a view of the world and through my lens, I am correct. And the chief marketing officer, through her view of the world, she is correct. So the debate isn't who's right. We're both right. Debate is whose aperture should we look through to make this decision? And so if you do that, you actually change this from a debate to a question of aperture. And, and that's like a really powerful way to look at this, right? Now you've got seven people around the room. We're trying to make a complex decision. And now it's not an argument and a judgment of correctness. It's now a question of like today, what is the aperture that matters most that we think through? And you'll hear that all the time. Right. Every time we have a disagreement, I'm like, OK, which aperture do we need to think through, think this through? And then we just decide the aperture and then it becomes a really easy uh, decision. Love that. Any others come to mind that they would say that they would bring up right up front? Uh, the other one I do, um, uh, I, I talk a lot about is um, I do this a lot with execs that, you know, come to work for me or get promoted um, to work for me as like, I do this, like, what's the difference between working for a CEO versus everybody else you've ever worked for? Um, and usually I'll get like, you know, kind of business school answers like, oh, you got to be cross-functional and you got to be strategic and, you know, stuff like that. And I'll say all of that's true. Um, but but um, my answer would be it's the first time you've worked for somebody that's never done your job before, right? So like if you're the CFO, you know, when you were the, you know, director of finance, right, you work for the VP of finance and the VP of finance got to be the VP of finance because they used to be the director of finance and were really good at it and they became the VP. And so they kind of knew what you did and could help you and tell you what to do and all this kind of stuff. And then 
but now you're the CFO and you work for the CEO. I've never been a CFO. They have no idea what a CFO does. And um, I always say like uh, empathetically, you know, compassionately, like it must be so disappointing, right? Like <laughs> you, you were, you spend 20, you spend your entire career, 25 years working your way up the ladder to finally join the C-suite and work for the CEO. And you realize he's an idiot. He knows nothing about what you do. Uh, and, and that's actually the real challenge, which is like, you know, how do you, how do you work for, for the guy or gal that knows nothing about what you do? Um, and it's a very different experience. Uh, it's working for a CEO. Um, and then the inverse of that, of course, is, you know, how does, you know, when I talk to CEOs, you know, how do you be a CEO where everybody that works for you is better at what they do than you are? You know, how do you add value in the, in the room, um, you know, or in a one-on-one? -on -one? Like, how do you talk to a CFO and they, you know, and do a one-on-one 30-minute -on -one meeting with them and they walk away going, that was helpful. Um, and that's the challenge of, of being a CEO. So how do you do that? Because I do think that's fascinating. And here's the other thing is the CEO in some ways knows what the standard is or what good looks like, or they know where they need to go, but they're almost entirely helpless in terms of telling you how to get there. Right. And so how, how have you, how have you navigated that? Yeah, it, it's, it's, it's really hard. Um, I guess I would say, you know, one of the things I, I tell, um, uh, executives is, you know, oftentimes execs will say like, you know, what do you want? You know, what are your expectations of me? Uh, and I, I'll say, uh, like, if that's your question for me, we've got a problem. Um, because I don't know, <laughs> right? Like, you know, I, I, I've never been a CFO. I'm picking on my CFO just to use the example. And, um, you know, part of your job is to show me what great looks like in, in the CFO position. Um, this job is as big as you will make it. Um, and if I gave you the expectation, all I'm doing is setting the boundary conditions for you. Hmm. Um, and so, so my job is actually to not set the boundary conditions. And your job is to show me, you know, how unbounded this can be. Um, and so, so let's, you know, get together every week and talk to me about what you're doing and like how I can help. Um, uh, along the way, but but um, uh, you shouldn't be asking me for for expectations. You should be setting them. I love that. I love that too. And and by the way, it's so true that the people who step into these roles, they have to be able to function with that level of ambiguity and autonomy. Otherwise, like it just doesn't work. It doesn't scale. None of none of it. None of it's built to function that way. So when in a world, just because a lot of the people who listen are going to try and figure this out in a world where somebody else is setting these expectations, because that's what they're supposed to do. How do you as the CEO know if they're high enough or, you know, especially before you have the experience of multiple CTOs or whatever the case is, how do you know if, if what they told you is great really is great? Yeah, uh, it's, it's hard and it, 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 it requires, it, it's some experience, it, it's some triangulation. Um, the, the way that I often coach other CEOs on this is um, uh, if the executive, especially in these growing companies, right? Um, I, as a CEO, you know, again, every, every day, you know, um, I come to work and, um, uh, you know, I'm less qualified the next day than I was the previous day. Like, it's just like, you know, my job keeps growing uh, every day. Um, uh, uh, and that's probably true for most of the execs, right? This is the biggest job they've ever held uh, for, for most of the execs. Um, and every day it's a bigger job. You know, it's, it's the biggest job they've ever held the next day. Um, if the exec is surprising you in a positive way, um, that's a good thing. Uh, and if they're not, that's not a good thing. Um, and so, you know, the example is like the CFO comes in and does something and you're like, oh, <laughs> I didn't know a CFO could do that. That's actually really cool. Like, that's great. That's really helpful. I didn't know, you know, that's like, that's positive. Uh, and if they're not, that's probably below the bar because by definition, I don't know what good looks like. 
Uh, and so if I'm surprised, hmm. then I'm learning what good looks like. But if I'm not surprised, then I'm not learning what good looks like. Um, and so to me, the, the surprise factor, like, whoa, they're, I'm learning something. Uh, they're doing something that I didn't expect. That tends to be the, the bar for me. I think that's amazing advice. Henry, we're down to the last five or so minutes. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the future of Carta. I, you wrote something that I just loved in one of your blog posts. I'm going to, I'm going to read it really quick. You said you want Carta's legacy to be this. And you, you talk about in the 90s and 2000s, GE produced highly sought after leaders. After spending their careers at D GE, dozens would go on to leave and become CEOs. PayPal has its mafia. I want Carta to be that. Why is that the legacy you want? And is it still the legacy you want for Carta? Like, what, why did you choose that? You know, Car Carta will be sort of this great, you know, hopefully this great company and, you know, being enduring and, and all of those things. But there's just something really special about, like, um, the journeys that, that um, people have, you know, a after Carta. That, that's super special. You know, I had a few great companies I got to work for, uh, a few great CEOs that I got to work for that I just, you know, learned so much from and, and credit to that. Um, I, I feel such a like a, a sense of gratitude for that. If I hadn't done those things, I don't think I would have done done Carta. Uh, and so I'm so grateful for that. And like I, I feel like it's part of the part of the continuation of of just building, you know, um, building humanity and sort of building technology and building, you know, um, society. Uh, and so this idea of like I could, you know, I could build Carta for myself in the in a sense, but like better than that is like um, uh, creating the opportunity for other people to build their own things that then, you know, replicate beyond that. Uh, and what's been really exciting is I think uh, there's been, you know, close to a dozen companies, maybe 14 or 15 at this point, uh, that Carta employees have started uh, that have, you know, raised, you know, uh, uh, capital, venture capital, um, uh, and gone on to, you know, do, do cool stuff. So that's been like just a amazing, uh, amazing to see, I, I got to say, like, and I've invested, I think, in almost every one of them. Uh, um, and it's just been such an incredible uh, thing to see. So I, I think, you know, I've always been a very, you know, in touch with, with you know, people and employees. And I think that's been the, the, the most gratifying part of this. Love that. All right. Um, what's the future for Carta? What, what's going to happen over the next 5, 10, 50 years? What does this turn into? You know, I, I think... Um, uh, we're spending a lot of time thinking about how what we've done in venture capital, which is kind of, you know, own that infrastructure for for cap tables, infrastructure for venture fund administration. Can we now take that into in the other asset classes? You know, next up really being private equity. Um, so so we're, I'm spending a lot of time learning about the private equity space. I think private equity is the next next kind of frontier for us. Um, then we'll we'll start looking at you know can we do things in in real in oil and gas renewables real estate uh, so I think we've got this engine now of you know as I talked about earlier this dematerialization of of private assets that we've we've cut our teeth on in venture uh, and can we now do that uh, do that in other markets uh, I'm also spending a lot of time internationally uh, so 90% of our re re revenue is domestic but we bought a couple companies in London. Uh, I was there last week. It was the week before that. I was in Dubai. Um, we've also got uh, uh, a bunch of people in in Singapore. So we're starting to look look uh, internationally and and building a, a sort of global presence. Uh, so I think if you look at us five seven years from now, I, I, I hope two things would be true. I I think we would be a, a global brand uh, and a multi asset brand. Beautiful. Last question for me, Henry is. The Henry of today, if you could have just a, a quick chat with the Henry who started eShares, what would you say? I think I would I would say um, slow down a little bit and enjoy the journey um, more. You know, I think um, one of the challenges of being a founder is you, you don't know if you're going to make it. And so you spend all your time, you know, just don't die where one of my favorite paul graham um uh essays is you know don't die uh which is which is the mantra i live by it was the, the thesis is like startups are basically binary outcomes you're either zero or you're a lot 
so one way to think about it is like I try to be a lot and you know I'll be a big big outcome. The other way is think about it is just don't die for long enough until you become a lot. And I I really thought of it that way, which is like instead of maximizing the outcome, I'll just just try to minimize the you know chance of of becoming nothing, of becoming zero. So just don't die long enough that some you know the other outcome happens. And and it's it's a great strategy and it it worked. But it's kind of like a miserable way to live, <laughs> and and so let's not to say like I didn't enjoy the journey, but if I had known that it would have worked out, I think I would have enjoyed it more. Uh, you know, but that's you know that's the thing about being a founder is you don't know um, uh, if it's going to yeah, work out. Yeah, the chatter is if you weren't that paranoid, Henry, maybe you would have died, right? So that's right. That's, that's right. a long combo we don't have to get into. The that's the that's the paradox. That's, that's the right. paradox. Final one from me. Quick popcorn questions. Who's an operator you admire, an investor you admire, and then the last one is, why are you the way that you are? Why, why are you this way? Uh, I'm a big fan of Parker Conrad at Rippling. You know, he's a three timer. Uh, he did his first company was that um, investment company, and then he did Zenefits, and then he's crushing it with Rippling. Yeah. Uh, you know, I just I've done it twice you know first time barely and second i like i don't know how the guy does it and he just every time he he get, goes to bat he hits it hits the ball harder uh so he, he's just uh, uh i i'm a big fan um uh, he's so impressive uh investor um uh mark andreessen i i just can't say enough of the guy um uh you know he when he led our round um you know uh on a sunday you know, he came to my house um, uh, uh, on a Sunday afternoon to bring me the term sheet in person uh, and with a Lego set for my son. Um, and I, whenever I talk to, to investors, you know, emerging managers, I say, look, if Mark Andreessen can bring, you know, a term sheet to me in person, uh, you know, with a Lego set for my son, you can too. Uh, uh, it's a seminal moment for a founder. Um, and and uh, he's he's inc in, incredible. Um, uh, and then you know why am I the way I am? I, you know, I'm just so lucky. Uh, I'm a little bit of an oddball, um, maybe more than a little bit. And I think in any other walk of life, I I would be just not successful. But I've seemed to have found that one niche in life where me being an odd duck um, is rewarded versus shunned. Um, so I'm, I'm really, I'm really lucky for that. Henry, this was awesome, man. Thank you for taking the time with us. We appreciate it and, uh, had an absolute blast. There's a lot of gems in there. Yeah. Thank you, Tyler. Thanks, Sterling. Thanks for having me. I honestly feel like this for, for founders and startup folks, this was the most applicable thing most applicable conversation we've had. I think you could make that argument, yeah. Everything from from that original hack to what what hires are like in the early days to how do you scale and what changes as you get bigger, he covered all of those with real life stories and examples from Carta. I think about themes of the podcast and he seemed to hit on like three or four of them. This idea of building a cult-like fanatic early early group of folks who believed in Carta when no one else did. I think of this idea of a founder has a unique insight that no one else has, and he's had like three or four of those, which is why Carta's expanded to be a platform. Ironically, his wasn't the yeah. original insight, but he had multiple of them when he got into to the arena and started building and, and listening to what the market was telling him. Yeah, 100%. Um, I loved his insight, loved his insight on investing or pitching investors as a filtering exercise. Like you're either in or you're out. I've got a vision for the future and you should get on board, but I'm not gonna worry about converting you. I think that's a great takeaway. Yeah, the other one that really stood out is customers can help you iterate, but they very rarely help you innovate. But the things that they're doing, their behaviors are telling you something. It's just they, they don't think or, or verbalize that. And that's a unique job of a founder. So let us know what you guys liked in the comments. And I think you're going to love it.